I'm here today with Steve Robertson. You're the outgoing president? Yeah, I finished up as president gone. in November, so I've got yes. two months to run, Amy. Okay, so <laughs> almost ex-president of Rand's Almost ex-president. Of Rand's I'll be a feather duster very soon. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve um, has given a few talks today. One yeah. was a bit impromptu, yep. it yep. seems. Um, yep. But what I'd like to talk to you about first is yep. um, the session that you had on the pelvic mesh, which has yes. obviously been a big controversy for the college in it the has. past 12 yes, months. Yes, I agree. It was an interesting session because yeah. it was the, uh, for me, it was the first time of hearing, I guess, you know, an, another side to the story, so to speak. Um, could you touch on, you spoke about what it was like for you personally. Yeah. Could you share some of that with us? Look, I don't for one second want to downplay the experiences of so many women who've had a bad experience and bad outcomes from mesh, and I could totally acknowledge that. But I think more broadly, if you look at the way mesh has played out almost a sociological phenomenon for us, um, there appear to be no winners. And if you um, look, for example, at now the reticence that a lot of us have about using some treatments that we know are very good and, and make women's lives a lot better, even having been touched by mesh, um, it's made women who, who don't even have, uh, haven't had mesh as a treatment or have had good outcomes apprehensive about using it. So we're making women's lives not better. But the other thing I don't think has been um, explored all that well, and I, I admit it's not anywhere on the scale or anywhere on the league of uh, women who've had a, a serious adverse outcome from a mesh complication, but it's been very difficult to manage. And I, I found that it was, I, I got completely depressed trying to deal with it and to deal with all of the competing uh, demands uh, around how to handle a response a response, a response that's respectful to women, a response that's respectful to my colleagues, and I guess a response that's that's respectful to, you know, people who run other regulators. And whenever there is an atmosphere of, of severe adverse outcomes, a lot of people are ducking and running for cover and trying to, you know, manage their own uh, risk uh, exposure and trying to manage all those forces. I found extremely difficult, and I had an agenda that I wanted to, to deal with that was around um, social justice and, and the college moving more into advocating for and helping women at disadvantage. And unfortunately, um, a lot of the political capital that I'd hoped to, to expend on that, I had to expend on mesh. So it meant that some of the other projects I think could have really been important for a lot of other women in society. Um, we just had to put on the back burner and didn't go ahead. And I think that was a real pity. I think. It, people don't I see it in terms of mesh which is naturally very important but it has many other dimensions to it that have not been good you said you shared with the session that there were some lessons that you sort of felt yep. the college needed to take from the episode yeah what were they I think the first lesson is that we need to question authority and I maybe it sounds like a simple thing but for many of us there was a strong sense that we could trust the therapeutic goods administration that we had a, a sense that the processes they had were robust and acted in the best interests of the public. But I think it subsequently became clear that perhaps that trust was not as, uh, was perhaps a little bit misplaced. Um, and <coughs> it, it leads to that eternal question that makes people uneasy, who do you trust? There was a huge sense in the community that you couldn't trust ONG specialists or doctors in general and doctors felt they couldn't trust the regulatory people around them. Um, everybody felt they couldn't trust lawyers. You know, I think there was a sense of unease because nobody knew who they could turn to, who they could rely on, who they could trust. And that those sort of things make people uneasy. And it's, an, it's a difficult experience um, trying to negotiate that at the highest level of being the president of a college. And I mean, we we were held responsible if, you, if people are trying to put a face to a, a kind of bad guy. I mean, I almost fell into that, that role and that was something I was not anticipating. I found it really difficult to, to work with. Yeah, how did it unfold personally for you? You shared some of that with the session. Yeah, well, when I took over as the, the president, I had been um, very keen to not let the issue, issue go undealt with and I wanted to say sorry. So the first thing I wanted to do was to make a very public accessible um, video 
that anybody could log on to, no matter who you were, and see that I was genuinely sorry to offer an apology and say that I really wanted to work with everybody concerned to make things better. Now, how you do that is, as we saw in the, in the talks today, is not so easy. But I wanted to make it clear that I was very sorry if people had had an adverse outcome um, and that we were keen to find ways to make people's lives better if they'd been harmed. But it was interesting. I don't think the video was received all that well by everybody. And I had a lot of personal communication, text messages, emails, um, things through Twitter from women saying, you know, you kind of you scumbag, you know, you're not really sorry at all. It's just a scam. You're just trying to avoid responsibility. Um, I had staff at my practice were literally rung by, uh, I presume, women who either had been harmed or friends or advocates for women who had been harmed. And my staff who were just trying to help my own patients were told, oh, your boss is a butcher. Uh, I had an incredible volume of nasty, really personal nasty email, you know, telling me you're, you are not a doctor, you don't run a medical practice, your practice is an abattoir, you butcher women. And I think when you, I'm actually getting emotional now talking about it because it's such a horrible experience to go through because I think when you're in a caring profession, as you know, Amy, your whole ethos is around wanting to help and to be, pardon me if I'm getting a bit emotional here, but it was an awful time for, to go through. And having that, it's like a stake through your heart because it gets right at the heart of what you are and what you, what you want to do. And I found that really awful. And I, you try to strike a balance between advocating for women who've been harmed, advocating for women who hadn't been harmed but needed right, the right treatment, advocating for your colleagues, trying to represent everything. It was complex enough without a lot of personal, awful, nasty um, vitriol in the middle of it all. I found it really difficult. What do you take from the episode? You know, I, I, you also had some questions for the yep. college and for yep. your colleagues, yep. which you said you didn't kind of have the answers for necessarily, but could you touch on what <laughs> some of those questions were? Because they were important questions. I think they're really important questions. I don't have the answer for them. But I guess there is a sense um, from a lot of doctors that they are over-regulated, that they're told what to do, that in some way institutions like the, our, our specialist college uh, are, intrude in the relationship that they have with patients and they take that personally. But I think the, the big lesson uh, from this that is really that we need to ask some questions. Where do we sit? How far do we go? Do we intrude things so fundamental as the doctor-patient relationship. If a doctor is speaking with a patient they're caring for and taking them through the consent procedure for an operation, do we, are we so intrusive we specify precisely what they need to say? Do we, um, in our public dealings, do we advocate for victims? And if you look, I know everybody hates me saying this, but if you look at perhaps over 130,000 women have various types of mesh implanted transvaginally. In reality, less than 1,000 are part of the um, class action. So which means it, it would suggest that we're like, well over 100,000 actually are very happy with the outcome. So do we try and close down a technique um, that has clearly helped many, many, many women and made their lives better? Um, do we advocate for fellows and try to protect them? Is it even possible to strike a balance between those things? Now, if it is, it's way beyond my capabilities, but I think we need to think about that. And I think we need to be very mindful that if we don't manage things well, the reputation of the profession is damaged and it takes a long time. It's like um, a relationship breakdown. It takes a long time for trust to be rebuilt. And people have to trust the advice they get from doctors. They have to trust the, um, uh, the, the way that doctors um, guide other doctors or institutions guide other doctors. And once that trust is broken, it, it parlays into other areas as well. They say, well, we shouldn't have trusted them on MeSH. Maybe we shouldn't trust them on the other advice they're giving. And it's, it feels sometimes like a total set of dominoes falling over. And uh, I think the biggest question for us is how do you possibly get the balance right 
that people have enough faith in what you you in your attempts to help them um, and you maintain their trust and, and people at all times understand that you you're putting them first and you're not your own self-interest or, or your reputation or anything that you are trying to help women and make their lives better and, and ultimately I think the big lesson is that that is such a valuable thing that it can't be underestimated. I'm sure I've made no sense of it. <laughs> <laughs> made perfect sense and it actually touches interestingly on your other talk which yeah. you, you were speaking about um, genetic screening, the yes. expanded genetic screening yes. project, a yes. huge undertaking it yep. sounds like in yep. Australia yep. Um, and the ethics in particular and the psychosocial yep. ramifications. I think your, your, your quote was Te the technology is easy and the rest of it is the, the really hard stuff. Uh, I think this is absolutely right. So we, the genomic technology has run so far ahead of society's capability of understanding what it can do and what it can deliver. It is way beyond my understanding, let alone the average person who isn't in a medical career, but has to make a decision. So what we're talking about here is the fundamental essence of being human. We are all imperfect. We all carry the seeds of imperfection in us. Now, admittedly, some of the seeds that we're talking about can potentially cause catastrophic illness in children. And all of us want nothing but the best for our children. But it is part of being human that we are imperfect. And we're now on the threshold of an era when it's possible to dissect in minute detail all the genetic imperfections that each of us, that you, that I carry, that everybody carry. And it gives us a choice. If we're going to have a family, do we accept imperfection? At what level do we say this is not an imperfection I want to accept in my children? Should you even be given that knowledge? Um, and one of the big things that frightens me very strongly is the concept that the genetic haves and the genetic have-nots, that the person who is well-informed and well-healed, so can afford, knows what's, what uh, the options are, will have a completely different family uh, or you know diversity in their family to the poor person who can't afford it or can't understand it or doesn't know how to make a choice or isn't helped to make a choice or made aware of the the options. And this is a fundamental question about what it is to be human and we're on the threshold of an entire country dealing with these issues and I don't think people um, have got their head around it. I mean I, I'm involved, I haven't got my head around it properly but it is a question of, of you know, what level of perfection do we want in ourselves as humans and the technology is totally available and it's becoming affordable and society has to have this discussion now before it's frankly taken over by commercial interests. We need to know where we're going and have a voice as a community, not as a doctor, or not even as a parent, but as a community as a whole. So I agree with you. I think there are many complex issues out there that we need to come to grips with and we need to come to grips with them soon, Amy. You spoke also about that being an issue for the profession. And yes. You know, ostensibly, you'll be at the forefront of these conversations. <laughs> How, like where do you, how do you where do you think the profession is at with these questions and the readiness to talk about them? I don't think the profession has any sense at all. There are probably only a handful of people in the whole country who get where we're at at the moment. I think one of the things I've been trying to do as college president is to um, bring people in the college along with the conversation. Um, I know that a lot of people you know see an email or a video from me and delete immediately, and I get that. But I, I, I think over time I'm hoping that people will understand the enormity of what technology can do for us and understand that we're at a, a threshold of really redefining humans. And I think I read a great book called Sapiens. And in the book I'm sure many of the people uh, who read Crokey may well be familiar with the book. I'm not sure if you've I've read, read it. it. I mean, yeah. <laughs> and I thought the kicker was right at the end of the book where he said, in fact, we've been rubbishing intelligent design, but it's starting now and we're now on the threshold where the intelligence is designing humans from here on in. And I think people don't realise that you know, what the author said in that is absolutely spot on and I think we need to be engaged in that conversation because it's fundamental to who we are. 
we are in the middle of these conversations. <laughs> where, like, where? Uh, this was the first I'd heard really yep. of the nuts and bolts, I suppose, yep. of the project. Yep. So, yep. where where are we at, and what is it going to involve? It is at a very early planning stage at the moment, um, and we have a number of questions. It's a very big group of people, and a number of questions have to be answered. And the, I, I guess, there are two aspects to it. If we're going to test people who want to become parents for rare conditions, but rare conditions that are potentially catastrophic for their children, where do you set the bar? Why is one condition perhaps more important than another? Why should some person's genetic condition uh, be tested for but another's not, and yet they both have the same potential for, for difficulty, um, harm, illness in children? So setting a bar, and it may be some level of, of um, a disability uh, that comes on at a certain age and is not treatable or not treatable cheaply or, or whatever. And at the moment, the, the talk is that perhaps there may well be close to 500 different genetic mutations that can lead to disease that should be tested for, and I suspect it will be at that level. There's so many. The next question is, if you're going to make a choice <coughs> about being tested for so many conditions, do you need to know everything about 500 conditions? I would think most genetic counsellors, most genetic specialists, wouldn't have a clue about most of the conditions on this list or what they do. And in fact, even the sum of whole human knowledge, these conditions may be so rare that people don't know a lot about them. So how, do you, how can you possibly um, counsel a couple in such a way that they can make a, a reasonable choice. I mean, these things are really hard to, to get across. Um, I think a lot of people, particularly who are disadvantaged, people who English is not their first language, people not familiar with the Australian health system, um, need to have equal, have equity of access to these things as the most highly educated person in the community or the most resourced person in the community. What does the community as a whole see about the process? Do we look at it from the point of view of what's the most economical way? You know, will taking these diseases out of the gene pool in Australia be an economic plus? Will it be an economic minus? Is it even right to look at it in economic terms? Is it something that should be beyond economics and purely uh, uh, be around... Uh, the morality of illness or whatever. I think one of the I think one of the most phenomenally good things that happened to me very early in the presidency was that we had a lot of literature that referred to uh, some genetic conditions um, as uh, you know the language in our documents was prejudicial and I'll use Down syndrome as an example we talked about the risk of a genetic abnormality. But for, for some people in the community, those are very pejorative, they're emotive words, and we had a long think about this, and ultimately we changed a lot of the wording in our documents from risk to chance, because risk has that pejorative term, you know, that it, it sounds uh, like it implies something bad. We took abnormality and changed it to condition so even simple things like the language you use to phrase the kind of conditions we're talking about are very, very important. Um, and uh, ultimately, um, what do people do with the information they have about their perfection, about their imperfections? So it's most likely that the screening will be done in what's called couple screening, so that only a condition where both members of a couple who are planning to have a family carry the same mutation and really have a risk uh, are told about that. Now it's partly to simplify things, but what about the, the tested material? Should it be stored? What might happen to it in the future? Uh, I think there's an enormous uh, concern about, um, for example, insurance implications, work implications. So again, it's a great example that the technology is relatively straightforward these days the implications of what the technology can provide for us are so profound a lot of people haven't thought them through. So it's a, it's a, an area of which I'm sure there'll be a lot of talk, Amy. Yeah, well, it sounds like it's kind of 
gallop. The horse has bolted in a sense before Absolutely. we've started having the conversation about whether we actually even want to do this or in what capacity we a wish to do it. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. You're absolutely right. Mm. Interesting times ahead. It's a pleasure talking to you. <laughs>